I'm so excited about this. We're in week two of mission series, and um, God inspiring us and speaking to us and encouraging us and, and um, launching us for bigger and better missions, exploits, and adventures for him. Isn't that good? Isn't that exciting? It's exciting for me. Last week, we, um, we began with um, our truth number one and our, and our point number one, and that was really simple, that God has always changed the world through broken-hearted people. And then we asked the question of ourselves. We asked the question, well, well how has broke, God broken our hearts? And, 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 um, and, 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 and I, I was amazed. We filled out these cards, and I was amazed about, there's nearly 200 of them out on the board. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't done that yet, man, today, as God speaks to you through the message and through, and through his Holy Spirit, I pray, you know, you fill out one of these cards. They're in the lobby and put it on the board with the rest of them. And we will, we will as a community, community, we will pray over these. How God is breaking our heart over the lost, over sin, over, over hurts in the world. And I thought it'd be good just to show a few of these. And so, Zach, and just we can look at them together and just get a picture of some of the stuff that people are writing that's breaking our hearts. You know, God always breaks the world. He changes the world through brokenhearted people, and it begins with us. Here, what breaks our heart? Teens who buy into the culture. That breaks this person's heart. Does that break your heart? It breaks my heart. How about abortion? The loss, the, 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 the horror of abortion. Alcohol and drug addiction and the family. That breaks, that breaks, that breaks our hearts. I think, I think most of these, you know, and I, and I picked them for this reason, it's, uni- it's universal in all of us. These things break our hearts. Children suffering. Does that break your heart? It breaks my heart. Children who suffer. For those who are ill, and, I, and the last word, and alone. You know, that breaks my heart. When people are ill and they're alone. Suicide. The fact that in this world, there is no hope for many people. And I... That breaks my heart. There was a, 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 a family member amongst us whose relative this past week, you know, is suffering through this and suffering through a family member who committed suicide. That breaks our hearts. Um, separated families, families who are apart, who are separated for all kinds of reasons. That breaks my heart. Abuse to the elderly, children and women. That breaks this person's heart. I love the smiley face in particular. That's why I picked that one. It's really good. Okay, mental illness and the family. That breaks our hearts. Mental illness. Does that break your heart? Youth with depression. Youth with drugs and alcoholism. That whole culture breaks this person's heart. Sickness in children breaks my heart. Sickness in body and all people breaks my heart. But I like this, but... Oh, praise God, there is healing through Jesus. Praise be to God. Isn't that good? That's a prayer. That's a prayer. But sickness, that, does that break your heart? I, I know the first word I told last week, what broke my heart, my first one was cancer. Cancer breaks my heart. And people I know, and family members, and people I've prayed for over the years, that br- it continually, over and over and over again, the sin of sickness, the consequence of sin in sickness and cancer breaks my heart. Is there more, Zach? Sin. I like that. This person wrote sin. That breaks their heart. Homeless. Veterans. Veterans that aren't treated right. That breaks this person's heart. That's amazing. Fatherless youth. Breaks this person's heart. Poverty. Breaks the heart. Sex trafficking. Breaks the heart. Anyway. Those are just a few. And I'd encourage you, stop at the board, read over them. You know, we use that as a prayer center, you know, for these next few weeks. Pray over those. May, you know, you can jot them down, even ones that are breaking your heart that you agree with. If there's something out there that you need to add to that, you do it. What breaks your heart? And you add that to it. So this week, week two. So last week, um, God always changes the world through a brokenhearted people. That is our truth for last week. This week, truth number two. God uses brokenhearted people to inspire action. Take out, your, take out your notes. That's the sermon of sentence. That's the first blank on your outline. That's the first blank on this outline. And that is God uses brokenhearted people to inspire action. To inspire action. 
Today I'm going to tell it simply, and we're going to, we had a ministry fair. I hope you saw that when you walked in the, in the doors this morning. And, and at the end of service, we're going to have some stories of ways you can be involved in our community. That will let God inspire action through you. To inspire action through you. So um, today, simply, i got a couple stories. i got a story from history, and i got Jesus telling a, a picture of what compassion and, a, and, and compassion and action, you know, um, a broken heart and action looks like. And, and then three simple application points for us. And then, like I said, we'll, we'll have some stories from some of us and, and a missions fair. So, so the first one, I want to tell you this, this story from history. I want to tell you about a guy named William Wilberforce. How many of you have heard of that name? William Wilberforce. Not a few of you. William Wilberforce. Uh, let, me, let me back it up just a little bit. The greatest tragedy. I've heard this said many, many times in the in this. In the, in the 18th and 19th and into the 20th century, the greatest travesty in all of humankind is the travesty of... Um... <laughs> Sometimes the words lose your mind. The travesty of um, slavery. What a word, lose your mind, to, to not miss. The travesty of slavery. And many of you think back to the ratif- um, when we ratified the 13th Amendment and we, and we, you know, through Lincoln and through the Civil War, right, and, and, and in America, uh, uh, civ- um, slavery was abolished here. But it began much before then. It began really with the abolitionist named William Wilberforce. He lived in England in the 1700s. Let me give you a couple of his quotes and, and try to weave a little bit of the story together really quickly for you. He said this, in October... Of 18, of 17, in October of 1787, he said this, God, how, God Almighty has set before me two great aims, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. William Wilberforce said that. He was 25 years old and he said that. The, the amazing thing is, four years before that, he and his friend William Pitt, who would, if you know history, British history, he would later become the um, prime minister of England. He and his friend at 21 years of age at a party on a whim, they both decided we will run for parliament. They were both young men of means and they both won their seats. William Wilberforce would not relinquish that seat for over 50 years. 50 years. And God, let me tell you this about him, God had broken his heart over the travesty and the injustice and the inhumanity of slavery. And of this, in particularly of the slave trade, which was the first element to, to abolish slavery. God had broken his heart over it. So in the fall of 1787, he's at this crossroads in his life. He's at the crossroads of his life because now he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's in parliament to this country which is supported and it supports the slave trade. And he has a newfound faith in Christ. Which, and he has this great turmoil going on in his life. What do I do? And at that point, he goes to see a friend, a childhood pastor, a childhood friend by the name of John Newton. You may recognize that name. John Newton penned, probably 30 years before this, the amazing song, Amazing Grace. John Newton, amazing story in himself. John Newton was early in his life, probably 40 years before this point, he was He was a notorious slave trader. He had a a slave ship, and he would travel down to the South Indies and get and and get and get and bound and 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 mistreat slaves and bring them up to England. And he was involved in that. And God broke his heart in 1748 and changed his life forever. He abandoned that life and became a pastor in England. And Newton and, and Wilberforce and his family knew Newton. And so he goes. Wilberforce goes to Newton on this day with this great thing going on in his life, this great what do I do in his life. He goes, I must quit Parliament. What do I do? And this is what Newton told him. And I quote, It is hoped and believed, young William, that the Lord has raised you up for the good of the nation." Wilberforce is saying, i got to quit my day job. I cannot do this. And God is saying, right where you sit, young William, God has you placed there for a reason. 
that you will impact a nation and you will impact the world. And, you, and it's true. We know now that William Wilberforce, he changed the world. He was not good sitting on the sideline. Wilberforce had a broken heart. He was not good going to church on Sunday. He was not good just going to Bible study on Wednesday night or just having a nice quiet time. That was not enough. Wilberforce had to do something with his faith. Thank God. And Newton encouraged him in that. He encouraged him, emboldened by this, by this encouragement from his friend in December, just a few months later, December of 1787. Actually, it was on Christmas Eve. He goes before Parliament, and he delivers a six-hour address. So you can count your, my 30 minutes this morning. But he delivers a six-hour address. And in that address, he says this. He says, my great aim is the abolition of the trade. He says, all others are secondary. He says, I will not rest until I have affected its cause. And that was true of William Wilberforce. He did not rest day or night. For the next 20 years, he fought and he got petitions. And, he, and every year, he would bring another, another case to the, to the parliament. And it would be voted down again and again and again. Because these men, their livelihoods were all wound up in the slave trade. For 20 years, he did that. Until finally, in February of 1807, England, because of the influence, primarily, of a William Wilberforce in February of 1807, England votes to abolish the trade. Hallelujah. 1833, 20 years later, three days before Wilberforce dies, three days, England votes to abolish and outlaw slavery. 32 years later, rippling across the Atlantic, then we know Lincoln, right? The 13th Amendment is ratified and slavery becomes abolished in the United States. Men, women, Wilberforce, it was not good enough for him to have a nice Sunday morning experience and have a quiet time Monday through Friday. That was not enough. He had to do something about his faith. And that's what, that's what God calls us to. He calls us to be about living out our faith. We talked about that a little bit last week, living out our faith, having on his glasses, seeing the world through his prism, making a difference with the, with the, with the life that God has given us to live. He had to do something. If, if you want more on this, there's an, tons of books. There's an amazing movie called Amazing Grace. I'd encourage it highly. Let's look at what Jesus had to say on this subject. Luke Chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. You know the story. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. It says, oh, by the way, it says in your planner, NIV. That was my bad. I told that to Yvonne. It's not NIV. It's the message. So this is taken from the Bible version called the message. And let's read this together. I'll I'll read it. You can follow along on on the screen. This is Jesus speaking here. Well, you'll you'll get it. The first one isn't Jesus. The first one is a religious scholar. Just then, a religious scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. And he said this. The religious scholar said this to Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? Good question. What do I need to do to be saved is what he was asking. Verse 26, Jesus answers. He says, What's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? The teacher said, he said, that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Jesus said, good answer. Do it and you will live. Looking for a loophole, he said this, and just how would you define a neighbor? Jesus answered by telling this story. Again, verse 30. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on his way was attacked by robbers. 
They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest, that's good, a religious guy, right? That, man, that must be good. A priest was on his way down the same road. That would be us. I know, that's really a bummer. But then, but when he saw him, he angled across the street to the other side. Then a Levite, ah, good, another religious leader. This is good news. Then a Levite, another religious man, showed up. He also avoided the injured man. Finally, a Samaritan traveling the road came on him. When he saw this man's condition, his heart was broken. His heart went out to him, the scripture says. His heart was broken. He gave him first aid, disinfectant, and bandaged his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him um, to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my tab. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Jesus is saying. So now he asks, Jesus is asking this question. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The religious man said. The one who treated him kindly. The religious scholar responded. Jesus said, go and do the same. Okay. I want to quickly look at the four individuals. Take a quick look at these four individuals. I'll, I'll, I'll name them out. And you can write them on the back of your planner. And, um, and, I'll, and I'll give a little brief, a little brief um, thought about each of them. I mean, boy, I did a lot of studying on this scripture, tons of, tons of reading on it this week. And I tell you, I could preach, you could preach months on this scripture. There's tons. But I'm just going to give you one little, couple little thoughts um, on each of them. But before I do, Good Samaritan, just the term, Good Samaritan, if you do a Google search on the word Good, Good Samaritan, you get 2.5 million hits. There are, it's, it's everywhere, right? There are Good Samaritan hospitals, retirement centers, churches, nonprofits. It goes every, there's tons and tons of them. Do these people not know the word Good Samaritan comes from the Bible and Jesus? You know, I mean, think about that. I mean, it, it infects our society, right? It infects our communities. Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan is synonymous today for being kind, for being compassionate, for not sitting on the sideline, for making a difference with your life. That's what Good Samaritan is synonymous with. Not just for us in church, for everyone. Jesus impacted the world like that. Amazing. Amazing. Four characters in this story. The first one, um, you can write him on the back. Number one is, um, is the lawyer. I call him the lawyer. He, he's the attorney, right? He's the, um, he's the religious scholar. Just a couple quick thoughts. He was all about the argument. He was all about, you know, you know being right. He was all about... Um, debate. He was all about trying to trap Jesus with a debate, with, with word mythology. I hate this kind of person. It's, it's a terrible kind of a way of thinking. His motivation wasn't compassion at all, but rather just to discuss and to debate and to challenge. I call this kind of person today the critic. How many of you know critics in your life who really don't want to do much of anything but love to poo-poo on all that you're doing or all that other people that you know are doing? You know people like that? We call, I call them the critic. That's all they're about is just criticizing. But when it, when, it, when it takes time to do something on their own, it's like they're nowhere to be found. The critic, the lawyer, the arguer. So that's one. God bless them. Lord Jesus, bless them. May they find peace and hope and hope in Jesus one day. The second one is the robbers. Robbers. These guys, um, these are just the bad guys, right? These guys came upon um, the, the, the man traveling, and they had nothing in it. I mean, they had nothing on their mind except for their own gain, Nothing but their own gain. It was all about me. It was all about themselves. They were the robbers. They were the takers. They were evil. They were the evil in the, in the story. They were looters taking advantage of a tragic situation and actually creating a tragic situation. So that's them. The, the third one are the priests and the Levites. You can write that down. Priests and Levites. And that's, you know, this is the one that breaks my heart the most because this is us. 
And this is the pastors. And you know, it's us. It's, it's, it particularly, it's the religious leaders. It's religious leaders. And you know, and you, you look at them. They did not want to get involved. My first thought, you know, they didn't want to get involved. They didn't want to get their hands dirty. They didn't want, you know, anything, you know, anything to do with it. You know, it, it's likely they were heading, you know, these are religious leaders. They, they may probably going to temple. And, you know, the guy might have been dead. If they touched him, they would have been unclean. And all, then they couldn't serve in their, you know, their capacity in the temple. Lord forbid. But that's the kind of thinking that was going on in their mind. You know, if they touch, if, you know, it's a Levitical law. If they touch a dead body, they would be unclean and then couldn't serve, couldn't go in the temple. And, you know, th- that might have been going through their mind. But um, they had their religious blinders on. Isn't that sad? Getting involved was the last thing on their mind. It would have interrupted their agenda, their religious agenda, their spiritual quote, spiritual agenda. That is sad. You meet people every day in your lives. I did this morning at Starbucks who need help. God doesn't call us to be religious. He calls us to care for people. He calls us to be on mission for him 24-7, to be on mission with him, for him with our lives. And to give of ourselves. That's what God is asking us. Jesus cares about people, and that's what we need to be about. Not about our agendas or being religious. He doesn't give a rip about being religious. And four, the final group, the, four, the, the final one is the Good Samaritan here. The Good Samaritan. He was all about compassion. He definitely had God's glasses on. He was looking through God's prism. He saw things the way God sees them. He could not sit on the sideline. He couldn't sit on the back. He had to take action. He had to move. He had to do something. He saw he need. He got involved. He got his hands dirty. He got involved. He he put his compassion into action. He looked, he saw, and he moved. He did something. How often do we, and I'm not, I'm not, me, How often do we look and we see and we know and then we categorize, okay, how bad do I, do I really, what should, and you know, we try to reason our way through these things and and how much and and should I and what will that, what will they do with it and they're going to use it for bad and, and, and all, you know, we, 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 we reason away our help so often or our compassion so often in our life. Do you do that? I do that. I'm not going to get, I buy, who knows what he's going to do with that? I'm not, I'm not going to take a chance. Not me. That money's valuable. But, but this man, the good Samaritan, this, and Jesus is telling the story, remember? So this is meant to mean something. Jesus meant it to have an application in our lives, and this is the application. And, he, he, and, and Jesus is telling the story, he understood that, 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 That his compassion, that being kind, might cost him something. The man, um, he he, he gave his own donkey, he gave his own medicine, he he took care of the guy, he touched an unclean man. He came back on his way home and and he dropped off two denarius, the scripture says, two, two coins, two silver coins, two denarius. Each denarius is two days labor. So you can add the, your own self. Each one is two days labor, so that was four days labor for the innkeeper to take care of this man. Four days labor. So you do your math. That's what he paid. It cost him something. Being kind cost him something. And it'll cost us something in our lives. Being kind, being compassionate, putting, you know, putting our mission in, in action it might cost us something. But, but my last point on this is my favorite point because not only does it cost us something, but it's God's way that compassion gives us something. It's God's way. It's God's way. Isn't it? Do you experience that in your life? I experience that in my life. That God, it gives us something. It's not, you know, I I like thinking about this way. It's not simply about giving something up. When I give my life to Christ, when I give my resources to Christ, when I give my time to Christ and his kingdom and his things, it's not so much about me giving something up. It's much more about me getting something better. Right? It's not giving something up. It's getting something better. 
You know, you think about people you know. You think about Mother Teresa. When she gave up her life to the people of India and the children of India, was she giving something up? She was getting something far better. Wilberforce, when he gave his life to the slave trade and the abolition of slavery and the abolitionist movement, was he giving something up? No, he got something far better. Last week I told the story of my friend DJ in Mexico who serves there and he, and, he, and he serves the orphans in Mexico and he's given his life for that, him and his wife. And he tells the story of sitting with that kid and giving him a Coke and crying on his way home and God changing his life through it. Was he giving something up? No, he got something better. Today he says it this way. He says, he says me and my wife, he says, we're selfish doing what we're doing. He says that about them. We're selfish. He, they gave up their life. They gave up their livelihoods. They gave up all income. But they're selfish because they know that living a life of meaning and purpose and passion and, and, and doing it for God is so much greater. There's so much more to be had, so much more to be gained, though we don't do it for gain. We do it for, for Christ's kingdom and for his cause, right? Does that make sense? Is that clear? The, the secret to all this, you know, is compassion isn't found in religion. Motivation for our compassion is not guilt. We don't do compassion over guilt. We do it over love. A greater love we have because Christ loved us so much that he gave himself for us. And we can't help. We are compelled, the scripture says, to give our lives away for him. That's our motivation. And the result is being Christ-like, being, being turned more and more into his image all the time. All the time. And you know, and I just, just a sidebar, people will not repay your kindness with kindness. Do you know that? I hope you know that. I love the way Mother Teresa says it. She says this. She says, people are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world your best. I love that line. Give the world your best, and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see, in the end, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them. Anyway, amazing stuff, Mother Teresa. So in conclusion, three ways God inspires action in us, in you, in me. Three ways. You can write the first one down. He inspires us to grow spiritually. He inspires us to grow up. He inspires us to be changed. He inspires us to look at the world the way he sees the world. He inspires us to, um, to, to, to have habits in our life that grow our faith and don't deplete us, to put aside childish things, as the scripture says, right, and put on godly things, to stop drinking of milk, as the scripture says, but to start eating real meat and being, being Christ's ambassador to the world by being filled up with him. We need to be grow spiritually. We need to be changed. When Christ comes into our life, he doesn't come in just to, just to rearrange your furniture a little bit. If, if, if the process of Christ coming into your life is Christ coming in and your life pretty much looks the same as it did before, you probably need to re-look at your faith. Christ comes into your life, he comes into my life to blow up your life. To blow it up, to change it, to make it different, to impact you for his kingdom. That doesn't mean that every single one of you need to go to seminary and get a degree and go on the mission. That isn't what that means. What it does mean is we need to live for him with the breath of life that he's given us every single day to make a difference for him, to make a difference in this world. That's what it means. We as a church are on mission for God. Oh, let me read the scripture first. I love the scripture. And I'm going to get into our, our mission fair and we'll call up our first um, speaker to talk about stuff. But since 
Look at this here. It's, it's, it's wonderful. In, in Colossians 1, 9 and 10. Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to, what does it say? To fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So that, that's the transition point, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing him in every way. And here's the, I circled this a lot of times, these next words, bearing fruit, bearing fruit in every good work. No matter your age, no matter your station in life, God is calling you to bear fruit, to make a difference with your life. We have um, a number, when you came in this morning, you saw those tables in the lobby. And um, there are missions opportunities. There are places we can put our feet and our hands and our, and, our, and, our, and our sweat in this community and around the world to make a difference for Christ. And right now, um, I want to I wanna call up um, um, the first one. Call up Shane. Come on up, Shane. Um, Shane, God really got a hold of his life and touched him. And, and he is on fire for, for God, um, specifically about this purpose. The idea of he recognizes he cannot sit where he's at, but God, he needs to grow up. So um, Shane, why don't you share with us? All right. Before I start, I've got to say, <laughs> I have more respect for everybody who comes up on this stage and talks, because I'm sitting on that bench sheet with my heart. And <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I'm here. <laughs> Come on, buddy. Uh, like Uncle Pete said, I'm Shane Titus, and um, I'm going to share with you how God broke my heart, how he broke the mediocrity in my life and showed me the potential for greatness. Uh, but first, let me share with you something I wrote a couple months ago. I had just gotten back from a leadership conference in Southern California called Cattles West and was pretty rocked by the experience. So as I lay in my bed in my hotel room, this is what I wrote. God truly awakened the wonder in me these past two days. I'm going to be a man that strives after God's heart, who puts others before himself, a man who dreams big and never asks, never, by never asking God how, but instead saying wow. Yes. Some, someone who is so grateful he could never be hateful who leads with courage, loves with grace, and always believes God's got something better. I want to live every second of my life to the full potential God has for me and never say I can't do something because, well, Philippians 4.13, right? So needless to say, I was pretty pumped. Uh, and here's why. The couple months leading up to this conference, I had sensed something in my life had to change, and I couldn't explain it. I mean... I have a great life, family who loves me, awesome friends, great church, working, doing what I love to do. I live where I'm five minutes away from the beach, for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, I'm spoiled, better than I deserve. But, I still, but still, I found myself searching for more, to the point where I was almost unhappy with my awesome life. I found myself angry at silly things, and I couldn't tell you why. I was so caught up in my, my world of how I can make my life better, I never stopped to think of how he could make my life better. Until a couple months ago when I went to Catalyst West, and the theme there was awakening the wonder in your life. And that's exactly what God did. Yeah. I learned that I had lost the wonder in my life, the wonder of God, and all he can do. You see, I had stopped dreaming, believing God had something better, and it was eating me up. I've grown up going to church all my life with parents who've loved me, or who loved God with every fiber of their being, and I had become comfortable. I had taken my faith and my life for granted. I had grown up working all my life, doing what I thought I would do the rest of my life, and again, I became comfortable. Not to say I don't like doing what I do. Heck, <laughs> I'm born for it. <laughs> but I believe, I believe now God is reaching out his hand, saying, Shane, there's so much more... I have for you if you will just get out of your comfort zone and go for it. Yes. Um, I've learned that I, I have a great life and I shouldn't take it for granted, but greatness is meant to serve a greater purpose. And now Come I'm on. open wide to whatever God has ahead of me. Andy Stanley said to awaken the wonder in yourself and in others 
You have to stir and disturb the hearts and minds of God's people. My heart has been stirred and my heart has been broken. And so when I got back from Catalyst, I started to look into things that would keep the wonder alive in me. I'm still not exactly sure what I'm going to do, but there is a couple of Bible schools in different parts of the world that I'm considering, where I would go for a semester to learn about God, be on mission, and also get to explore God's creation. And it's really starting to look like something God wants me to do. I mean, why not? Like I said before, I'm going to be the man who says, wow, God, and not how, God. I just like to thank Pastor and Uncle Pete and um, all of you for being a cornerstone in my life. To my family and friends uh, who, have contrib or who continue to encourage me, and my parents. My dad and mom are truly yes. the greatest example of God's love. And I, uh, man. Dusty in here. Uh -huh. And I never couldn't got to this point without them. Um, to this point where I'm going to be a man who strives after God's heart, who puts others before himself, who dreams big by never asking God how, but instead saying wow. Someone who is so grateful he could never be hateful, who leads with courage, loves with grace, and always believes God's got something better. I want to live every second of my life to the full potential God has for me and never say I can't do something because Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you. Wow, amazing stuff. No matter what your age, no matter what your position, God wants us to keep growing up in our faith. Shane, that's a great example of that. A great example of that. God touches our hearts and we need to continue to grow up. One great way, young people in particular and families, go to Radical Reality Youth Camp with Ryan this summer. An amazing thing. An amazing way to keep growing your faith. There's tables in the lobby about, about those, those, these items and more. Um, so sign in on them. So number one, he inspires us to grow up. Number two, he inspires us to serve locally. He inspires us to serve locally. That's your Monday through Friday life, to serve locally. Look what John the Baptist says. I love this scripture out of Luke. He says, what should we do then? The crowd asking of John. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. That's my John the Baptist voice. You know, he's saying it out to the crowds, right? If you have none, share yours with those who have none. But that's what John was doing. You know, and you picture the desert and him shouting it out to the, to the crowds. That was wonderful. John the Baptist said that. And we've got all kinds of opportunities for you to get involved. Look at this. There, most of these tables are in the lobby. SOS, serve our Savior. You know, our ministry goes on once a month. Santa Cruz County Fair, we serve at the fair you know, once a year, it makes an amazing difference. Um, our imprint is out there. Moms in prayer, Lupe's got a table in the lobby. Get involved there. See how you can be involved. Teen Challenge, Paro Valley Rescue Mission, Jacob's Heart, the Pregnancy Resource Center, amazing, amazing organization. PV Shelters, Annette's in the lobby with stuff from PV Shelters. You can go out to these tables and talk to these people about ways you can be involved. And the big one I want all of you to be involved in, Deanna, come on up. Is, um, is Meals on Main Street. This summer, we we're going to have a big outreach in the park called Meals on Main Street, but Indiana's going to tell us a little bit about that. First, before I talk about Meal on Main Street, I was sitting on the front row this morning, and mm. um, it just it struck me. We don't ever, um, on a Sunday morning, not have guitar players. Um, Walt was gone for the weekend, and Cal's wife is sick, and I was just thinking of when I was young, in high school that um, growing up in a church in San Jose, I played the piano, but I didn't play by ear very well. And I, um, they were gracious enough to let me play the second piano. There were two pianos um, in the church. And I sat next to a wonderful pianist named Ramona Crabtree. And I, I played wrong chords a lot, but I learned. And I, I learned how to play behind um, the worship and I learned how to play behind the prayer. and. It struck me this morning that there's probably guitar players sitting here. Yes, 
who probably say, oh, they've got plenty and I don't want to serve. But there's room for you. You could come, you don't have to have your amp loud, but you could come play next to these guitar players and Ellie, the bass player, who are just incredible. They're incredible. <laughs> and you could learn. And um, yeah. And also singing. You could come stand next to Doug or stand next to one of Corey. My goodness, sit next to her and just learn how to belt like she does. Is that all you <laughs> the, do is sit next to her and I can learn to belt like you her? You could. <laughs> It takes people to imitate. That's how we learn. And so, Meal on Main Street. We have, for years, for 15 years, the choir and the orchestra have gone to the rescue mission in San Francisco and worked alongside uh, Roger Huang. And we have served meals. We've given a concert in the street. And it's been this incredible outreach. And some of the people in choir would say, when are we going to do this in Watsonville? When are we going to go to San Francisco every year? When are we going to do it in Watsonville? So. Um, it was a miracle. It was two Novembers ago. We were asked to sing at SOS, the uh, Serving Our Savior, which is meals at Salvation Army the fourth Saturday of the month. The choir went and sang, and we sat with the captain afterwards, and he said, can we do like an outreach here, like where we give a meal, and you guys sing? And I said, "Woohoo! That's just what we want to do. <laughs> and it was just the time when San Francisco was transitioning um, into somebody else's leadership and we weren't going to be doing that anymore. So last year we planned on having 400, singing to 400 and feeding 400 and giving over 200 backpacks to kids and we ran out of food and we ran out of backpacks. Yeah. So this year we're planning on 500 and um, I would just love you all to be involved. So much to do that morning, so much, so many people that are there for you to look to and touch and love and serve the meal to and give a backpack to in the name of Jesus. And it does not go unnoticed. One story, a lady who owned a business around the corner from the plaza, she started hearing the choir sing and she, she, she said, what's going on? Because you don't, you hear mariachi music downtown Watsonville. <laughs> and she said, it's like the angels were singing. She says, I closed my shop locked the door, and I walked down the street, and she said, I was engulfed in the presence of God. <laughs> and I thought, if God could use us yeah. to call a shop owner, he'll use us to call people that just drive up to go to the bank. He'll use us. And so we'd love, there's going to be a table. Um, Diana and Steve stand. Raymond, where are you? He's probably in the coffee house. Raymond, he's in the coffee house. And Lupe Nava will be at the table, and you can, you can see them. Super, super. Everyone needs to... This is our community. This is our event. And so we all need to be involved. And there's places for all of us to serve. And, um, and, 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 and I want you all to do that. So, so check it out afterwards. Our greatest and our most influential ministry probably is our school. And I asked Pastor Jeff to come and, and give a quick history of how he got here serving in our school and the impact our school makes in this community. Pastor Jeff. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I said good morning. Good morning. Oh, I just want to make sure you were still awake. Yeah, we're here. Um, that, that was amazing. There's no way you couldn't be awake after those two testimonies. That was pretty cool. Good stuff. Um, the way I came to be here is pretty amazing. God, you look back and you see the passageway that God has set up for your life. And you always think hindsight's 2020. Oh, yeah, that's why that happened. And that's why that decision happened. But... With Kelly and I, we started out um, working in the North Bay. We were up in Vallejo working with kids who um, lived below the poverty level. Um, there was about 400 families on our roster. It fluctuated between 350 and 400, and we'd go out on a weekly basis. We had sidewalk Sunday schools, which were really fun. I had a big 19. 57 milk truck that I cut a door out of the side of it and it'd go down. It was pneumatic, big speakers. We'd set it up to where it was. I mean, we'd have 50, 60 kids in a park and they would show up for Sunday school, middle of the week. Because we were working in neighborhoods where um, there were kids who had a lot of needs and it was fun. We'd hand out super soakers and cookies and the, we did it for years. We had bus routes that we bring them in on Sundays. Our, our, the children's 
we'd have two services on Sundays between 250, 300 kids each service because we'd bring them in on buses. We had six buses that would go in and out and in and out. It was really fun. But there was something I saw while I was doing it that um, broke my heart. Um, we were reaching out to these kids, and I believe the touch point for people is the spiritual um, arena. I believe that God makes the pathways open. But we were not following the model. Jesus met the physical need first. If you look in scripture, that's what he did. And once he met the physical need, then he forgave sin, and all that happened. So as we were going through this, Kelly and I kept looking at it and going, we're touching these kids, and we're seeing lives change. There were you know, kids, we're seeing them get through high school, kids that would normally have dropped out, and we're, the kids that were in our programs, but there were so many that weren't. And so my heart was broken, and I said, God, what do you want us to do? And he spoke to me, and he said, you've got to go back to school. You've got to make it so that you can help the whole child. Um, so I did. I followed my dad's footsteps, and I went back to school, um, went through the credentialing pro program at CSUMB for my teaching credential. And part of that was moving down here. We were up in the North Bay. We searched for churches, couldn't find one that fit right in that area until um, Pastor Kofelt's son, Rich Kofelt, and I worked with him up in the North Bay, said, I know it's 40 miles away, but, or 30 miles away, but check out this church called Green Valley. <laughs> and Kelly and I are like, ah, that's a long drive. And we walked in, and of course, Ray and Judy won us over right away. They're the most amazing folks. They just treated us like family, took us over to their house that afternoon. We were like, yeah, I know, who does that stuff? But all of that to say, I was working as a bread man, going to school full time to get my credential, all that stuff. It was amazing. Didn't sleep very much, but was enjoying it. And while we were coming here, somebody said, well, you know, there's a school there. And so when it came time for my student teaching, I came in and said, do you mind if I run around for a year and go from class to class? And Sharon Harris, who's the principal for a few more months, she's retiring this year, it's, it blows my mind. But she said, come on in, very just welcoming. And I came in and I saw a, a place that did what I was looking for. What that broke your heart about. Yeah, what my heart had been broken about. Here is a school where it's a melding of growing the whole child, the spiritual, the academic, the social. That's their goal. It's our goal. This is your ministry. This is our ministry. Where kids coming through here don't go out just with their knowing addition, subtraction, and multiplication, how to read and how to write. They go out also knowing who Jesus is yeah. and what their purpose in life is, or at least the track to what their purpose in life is. And, um, Thank you, Jeff. Oh, it's so good. I can, <laughs> Thank you, who got it? Without your, without your giving, without your love, without the hours you put in, I see guys putting in flooring over there. I see guys fixing windows for free. That's what keeps this ministry going. And it's hugely impactful because it trickles down. It's not just the kids, but those kids go home. And because of that, we have Pastor Ryan. You understand that, right? Without that ministry, I wouldn't have my best buddy or one of my best buddies sitting on the front pew up here. It's a huge impact. And just so you hear it, I'm grateful. And I know that God has big plans for it. So if you um, feel called, if that's something that breaks your heart, get involved. I encourage you. Thanks. There's a table in the lobby full of school stuff. You can check it out, whether you, you want to volunteer, and it's harder because it's a school, but there are ways, um, or bring kids, or whatever it is, but check it out and learn more in the lobby. So one, he inspires us to grow spiritually. Two, he inspires us to serve locally, to make a difference Monday through Friday with the lives God has lived, us living every day. And three, he inspires us to go globally, to go globally. Mark 16, 15 said, Jesus said this, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel, make a difference, bring people to me, 
goes on to say, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and, and, and bring them to me. We are called to the world. We are called locally. We are called to grow. We are also called to the world. This summer, there's projects you can get involved with. We got our Mexico mission project this summer. You can go check out the table out there. We got um, um, Evan, my son Evan. I, oh, normally, you know, I love getting dressed up on Sundays, but I'm dressed in my missions attire today. So that's why I'm supposed to inspire you to missions. This is my, my son's on the mission field. Evan, he's in Panama City this morning at the Panama Canal. Actually, he's, they're, they're serving down there in Panama. And this is his shirt. And he's got a table out there with some of his blogs. We've read some of them, but you can pick up paper copies in the lobby. Um, but, but, but you can find out more about that. Casa de Maria Skills Center is there. And also, this fall, um, and you can find out more about all those ministries. Stop at the tables. Talk to the people. Be encouraged. This fall, we're looking for the first time as a community. Actually, myself, Joe, and Juan, um, friends of mine, they're sitting right over here, went to Haiti in February breaking ground for a new ministry and i was in touch this past few weeks with with us with an organization we're going to serve with there mike and amy revis and and um and, I, and i've got a video of theirs and i want to show that to you it's three minutes long i'll show that to you right now to inspire you about world missions and we're going to talk about this for the next couple of weeks this weekend next the rest of this weekend next week and uh, but i want to inspire you to world missions and what they're doing in haiti There's an underlying factor that there are not enough jobs here. People who have been extreme poverty, as a matter of fact, abject poverty. Our ministry was built on uh, building the family and providing jobs for uh, the people, the community, and the greater community of, uh, of Bearson. We have two programs in place for two years now, even without us being here in Haiti. It's been amazing to watch the Haitians take ownership, take part of, and uh, put the programs in place. One is a feeding program. We want to keep the families on as a temporary program. So the goal is to get them a job, to create a job where they can now come off of the feeding program, earn money on their own, bring it home, and be able to support their own family along with the children's program too. We want to pour into the children just as much as we do the adults. And that's that family unit that we're talking about. So again, Bible stories, feeding them both spiritually and physically. Talking to the community, what are their needs? And how can we guide and help them so they can reach their needs? But how can they sustain that all on their own? So what happened was when we asked the village chief for acreage, we ended up getting 50 acres here. You know, what you see here today, we're going to plant close to 14,000 plantains. And, but then also we have a, a guest house too that's going to focus on hospitality. It's going to be a full functioning, uh, uh, self-sustaining project. Our goal is to build about uh, 12 um, residences for orphans and vulnerable children that uh, supplies um, um, both physical and spiritual needs for these kids and to be in an environment that's safe, secure. Um, you have loving people that are going to care for you. Um, we're going to be here throughout the time that they're here. We want to become a family to them. It bridges that gap so we can minister to them from a spiritual standpoint and then also now we're going to have a high school. So now they're going to be educated. As we know, not everybody goes to college. And so we're excited uh, to partner with Extol International. They're going to build us a great vocational school. So within that vocational school, actually, they're going to have five business classes. And then on top of that, we're looking at hospitality and things that they can take now from uh, the vocational school and actually get a job. So they're not just going to be uh, kids that are going to go back into society and kind of blend in and be a vendor or uh, drive a tap tap. Although those are things that are need needed here in Haiti, we want them to be teachers, doctors, nurses, um, lawyers, great people that can serve, serve their communities and uh, integrate back in and actually be a part that uh, changes the country. And all with God's help. We want them to be the leaders and um, take pride in where they live.
Are you full? Let me just end with this. The question that the religious leader asked Jesus was a good one. Teacher, what do I, knew, what do I need to do to be saved? How do I know that I'm saved? I wrote this down from a professor um, at Trinity Evangel Evangelical Divinity School, um, Crawford Loritz, and he says it this way. He says, the way we know we're saved is by our fruit. By our fruit. And he says it this way. It's a changed and changing lifestyle that is not the byproduct of the normal maturation a product of adulthood, but rather it's a changed and changing lifestyle that is in direct correlation to the presence, power, and activity of the Spirit of God living inside of me. That's what it's about. God's Spirit living inside of us in such a way that our lives are changed and they're changing and they're never going to be the same again and we are on mission for God and going to make a difference for Him in Watsonville and Powell Valley and around the world. My altar call is this. Will you join me? Two things. Two things. Will you join me? One, will you continue to ask God to break your heart? Break your heart over the things that break his. Will you do that with me? And two, will you pray the prayer with me? God, use me. Monday through Friday, when I'm at work, when I'm doing what I do. Lord God, break my heart over the things that break yours and open up opportunities for me to be used by you. Inspire me to action. If, those, if you'd agree with me, and join me in this prayer. If that's your prayer too, would you stand? If you would join me in this call to be people of action for this community and this world that need Jesus, that need a Savior, that, that people who are lost and hurting and dying, join me. And I'm going to pray a, a closing prayer, and Ryan's going to come and dismiss us. But join me as, as I pray, as we pray. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks. For your presence here with us this morning, Lord God. And I do pray. Holy Spirit, come. And I pray that you would break our hearts. Each and every one of us. Break our hearts over sin. Break our hearts over the loss. Break our hearts over hurting and suffering people and children. And addiction. And, 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 and stuff that breaks your heart, Lord God. May we be broken. And Lord God, I pray that you would open opportunities. And you would open up doors. And you would open up fields. And Lord God, you would help us be courageous to step out for you and to make a difference with the breath of life that you have given us to live for you. May we have your lenses on to see the world as you see it and never be, never be satisfied with just the way things are, but only wanting to be things better as, as you would have them be. Thank you so much for this body of Christ, Lord God, your hands and your feet to this community. May we be about your business. We be, may we be, be about making a difference for you in Watsonville and the Paro Valley. Thank you, Jesus. We'll be quick in giving you all the thanks and all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Thanks for joining with us today in our live streaming of our service and our message. We're grateful that you joined with us. And if we can serve in any way, we'd be glad to do that. Just check out our website. That'll get you connected in any way that you might like to. And uh, that is greenvalleychurch.net. And we wish you the best and know that you really do matter to God. Have a great day.